All right, welcome back. Hope you had a good coffee break. So we're going to get started with uh, the next session. It's uh, a panel on monitoring. The panelists are uh, Alexander from Pessimistic Security, uh, Carlos from uh, Forda Foundation, Dumantas from uh, Lossless, Gal from Hypernative, Mir from uh, Cybers, Asaf from Iron Blocks, Andy from Blocksec, and uh, Yanev from Hexagate. And it's going to be uh, moderated by Ernesto from uh, BGD Labs. Thank you. Please give them a warm welcome. Yeah. So, hello, everybody. Uh, as Reggie presented, like I'm, I'm Ernesto uh, from BGD Labs. Uh, we are working on AVE, on the AVE protocol. Uh, previously, I was like, yeah, the CTO uh, on, on the AVE Genesis team that created the AVE protocol. And, but, uh, yeah, today we have quite a lot of people here. Like, and the idea is that uh, well, there is a lot of talks of uh, security procedures and security tools uh, during this uh, DSS. Uh, some of them, like, is quite a lot of them are uh, more focused on pre-production. Uh, but uh, well, we, we want to talk a bit about what happens when smart contracts get deployed, when you have production systems uh, and all the tools that all these people here, uh, what they can help uh, for, for these kind of systems. So, yeah, maybe the elephant in the room first, that uh, there is a lot of hacks. There is a lot of capital uh, getting exploited, like uh, in a weekly basis, sadly, uh, on on DeFi and in blockchain systems. So, looking at that, uh, can we prevent that? Is the big question. Uh, is it realistic to to prevent that? And maybe if you can give your 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 thoughts about that. And at the same time, maybe you can present yourself, like uh, if you want a bit more. Maybe we can start uh, in order. So, Andy. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Andy, and I'm the CEO of BlockSec. Um, BlockSec is um, a security company um, focusing on build um, interesting things for the um, DeFi and for the blockchain uh, area. So we um, we have a couple of tools and uh, um, to uh, monitor the uh, ongoing threats and ongoing ongoing attacks, and we have some internal systems to you know to um, trying to block such uh, threats. And we also provide some um, plugins and uh, fund analysis tools to the whole community to fully understand how the um, um, uh, to, fu to fully understand how the fund goes after an attack. Um, yeah, so uh, this is basically an introduction of me and um, the uh, company. So uh, in terms of your question, um, so can we uh, detect the, uh, the attacks and can we prevent them? I think the answer is uh, both yes and no. And uh, from one perspective, um, um, we, uh, I think every guys here are the expert in the DeFi security area and we are, uh, every day we are um, developing some methodologies, strategies to um, try to detect, detect the DeFi hacks. And uh, if one person asks me that, uh, Andy, can you um, detect all the uh, happening attacks? Uh, my simple question is uh, yes, but that doesn't matter because if I mark all the transactions as malicious transactions, as attack transactions, then certainly I can detect all the hacks. But the problem is that we need to maintain a balance between the false positive and the false negative, right? So if we develop a product for our customers and we have a monitoring alerting system for our customers, we uh, if our system can report like uh, 50 or 100 alerts or even uh, 200 alerts every day, then no one will look at your system again because most of them are false positives. So we need to maintain a very good uh, balance between false positive and false negative. That's what we are uh, trying to do inside BlockSec. We have some um, a good strategy, you know, we're trying to detect the attacks, but we're trying to maintain the uh, false positives. I think uh, so um, from uh, this direction, I think um, in the uh, future, we, uh, uh, by the efforts of the community, by uh, all these guys working in the security community, I think we can detect most of the attacks, not uh, even all of them, but we can detect most of them. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. yeah, let's let's keep it a bit short, like the, the introduction, because mm -hmm. I think we have plenty of topics to, to discuss. All right. I will make it short. 
Uh, so my name is Mir Dolev, co-founder and CTO at Cybers. Cybers is an AI-powered threat detection and response platform, uh, proactively securing DeFi protocols and other crypto businesses. So about your question, so it's yes, we can detect them, but we can, cannot prevent everything, right? Uh, so we can detect uh, attacks on DeFi, and we saw that recently uh, we detected the Poly Networks attack and the multi-chain attack that it was more about private key leakage. Cybers detected them in real time, also shared the alerts with the communi community via, via our Twitter, Twitter channel. But as Andy said, it's not only about detection, right? You can alert on every transaction, but the false positive will be very high. So it's about effective detection and actionable insights. And actionable insights are very important uh, for detecting an early, uh, uh, to give an early warning and, uh, for potential threats, uh, automate response, but meanwhile maintaining a low false positive rate in order to prevent pause of protocols and uh, contracts, right? So this is a trade-off always between uh, recall and uh, precision, and with Cybers, we have almost 100 years of experience in AI uh, detection and AI application. So this is what we are doing in Daily Manor. Yeah, so uh, I'm Domantas Pilatus. I'm co-founder and CDO at Lossless. Uh, basically, we started Lossless with the idea of building on-chain uh, hack prevention and mitigation system, uh, which is basically, which allows you to freeze and retrieve assets from, from like many different exploits. Uh, and we already managed to, to freeze and retrieve hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I guess that answers the question that yes, it's possible to like spot and, and like manage retrieval of these assets. Uh, but very early while building a lossless on-chain mitigation uh, platform, we realized that you also kind of need to have a good uh, detection system in order to spot these incidents early. So we started building uh, Lossless Aegis, which is our current focus. And it is a threat detection system, which, which yeah, is kind of open for everyone to use and, and is powered by a lot of heuristic-based rules that kind of, I guess, a lot of other guys here use, but also we, we use different AI modules to to help us to, to spot these incidents. So yeah, yeah, that's lossless. Hi, Asaf Eli, CTO of Iron Blocks, uh, prevention and detection of uh, malicious activity on the blockchain. Uh, I believe that we can prevent most of the attacks that happen today. Uh, the ones that uh, will be much more difficult, they're the unknowns of the futures, but most of the attacks today are possible to prevent. Hey, so oh. <laughs> um, great being here, and thank you, Sir Tora, and the rest of the sponsors of uh, hosting this event. Uh, my name is Yaniv, um, uh, CEO at Exagate. Exagate is a Web3 security provider. We build uh, a real time Web3 threat intelligence system that basically provides early detection on all types of Web3 threats, uh, ranging from cyber exploit to financial exploit to phishing, fraud, and scams. Um, regarding your question, so, so first, you know, think two years ago, DeFi Summer, if you would start try to build this kind of panel, you wouldn't find anyone. So I think with everyone that are sitting here in the panel, uh, and I'm seeing Andy there, uh, from Forta, so uh, you have enough people in the space that are working on this problem each and every day. Um, and we see, at least from the tweeters of everyone here, that everyone can detect exploits. Um, I'm sure not like 100% of the exploits are detectable, um, but with time we, we will have more and more coverage. Um, when we started the company, we, wasn't, we weren't sure that we will be able to have like such an accurate uh, detection models. Uh, but luckily, because the nature of blockchain, because the data is there, um, and you start to see these patterns and you build uh, the right models, um, exploits and other threats are detectable. Uh, and then you need to optimize, and we put a lot of effort there. And I know that the rest of the, the pack here is doing the same thing on early detection, right? Now, of course, not everything can be early detected, like atomic, uh, exploits, right? Luckily, today, 
uh, with exploiters. So running an exploit operation takes a lot of experience and they leave these like traces. Um, so, so many types of hacks are detectable, but I think that detection, and, and again, we see it with everyone here, and, and I think like the next step is for collaboration in the space where like detection models and companies will collaborate and send the alert to like a security orchestration platform where you will have the right incest response uh, procedures and you'll have a better coverage because it's not like one company because each and every one, for example, uh, if, although everyone are saying AI and machine learning or security heuristics, you take a different approach. You have different personnel, you have diff different ideas, right? Um, so I think that we'll see in the upcoming year more of this kind of collaboration and orchestration um, that will improve the security in the ecosystem. For sure, I would say that most of the hacks are detectable, even atomic ones. Um, it's just a matter of also from the protocol side of things, um, how they should build their, their procedures, um, and we'll talk about it, of course, in the, in the panel, I think, um, how you need to orchestrate everything in order to protect the system. Okay. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I am Gal from uh, Hypernative. Hypernative builds a platform to detect and prevent all sorts of risk uh, from on-chain, from security to financial governance and community-based uh, risk. Uh, I, I think in addition to, to what was uh, said here, I think that in the end, when we look at security and any other uh, domain or industry, security is always a layered approach. Like it's not, it's not a zero, zero sum game. There isn't one solution that can fit all. We need to use a combination of solution, a combination of techniques and combination of preventive mechanism to really protect in the end uh, the user funds and the community, which I think invest and put their money, their identity and trust uh, in the protocols. So I think everyone here are trying to uh, increase that awareness and create uh, tools. And I think we all obviously believe that uh, what we are building uh, can help and prevent more hacks and exploit. Uh, and I believe it's, it's an ever evolving uh, process of uh, adjusting, right? Adjusting the security solutions, adjusting the attack techniques and trying to find more and more uh, of these risks and uh, mitigate them. Hi, I'm Carlos, currently a data scientist at Forta. Uh, at Forta, we do real-time network monitoring to find um, threats and scams and so on. And going back a little bit to the question of can these threats, scams be detected? The answer is absolutely, just wait two hours and someone will see that scam, like the funds have been gone, right? Or you're always going to find it, but if you find it two hours afterwards, it's absolutely pointless. So it's a little bit what, the, what everyone has been commenting on. Can we be early enough so that you actually can take action and can defend the funds or can help defend and not just find that something has disappeared? Because you're always going to find that something has disappeared a posteriori anyway, so. Hi, my name is Alex. I'm CEO of Pessimistic Security. Uh, Carlos stole my point uh, about uh, that, about that, of course, we can detect hack. Uh, but um, I would also add uh, on this that even knowing about the hack that is all, that all has already happened is use, can be useful for the protocol because the faster they know about it, uh, so f we, we all remember the case with the Ronin protocol when they didn't know about uh, the hack like seven days after it happened. So uh, even, in the, even two hours after the hack happened, it can be still useful. Uh, the knowledge about it can be still useful. So. And uh, I would also add, uh, add uh, on the point about false positive rate, uh, that the earlier you can throw the alert, the earlier you can launch the defensive action, uh, the, the more you are ready to, you know, to, to deal with the higher, slightly higher po false positive rates. Uh, I mean that uh, if you, uh, if, if you react within five seconds and uh, have, for example, false positive rate of 10%, it, 
it's better than if you have false positive rate of zero and you react within five minutes. This is my point. So, and I think everyone here agrees. Uh, yeah, and I forgot to uh, introduce myself. So, uh, yeah, we at Pessimistic Security, we have been working in Web3 security for six years and we performed hundreds of security audits. We developed several uh, tools for developers, mainly focused on security also, on static code analysis. And last year we started developing Spotter, uh, the product that is aimed at, uh, at uh, detecting and uh, preventing the hacks as early at this, as it is theoretically possible. Yeah, okay. uh, l let's follow up in, in, in that topic. It's, it's a pretty interesting one of uh, false positives. So, uh, well, as, as we know, like the big majority of DeFi is, uh, is quite open. Uh, in a lot of cases, it's uh, controlled by even smart contracts like governance, uh, in, the, in the case of Ave, let's say. Uh, and false, false positives, it feels like that if you act uh, and you do something on false positives, it can create like some problems. So, what is your take? Maybe we can, yeah, we can have like two or three people commenting on that, like uh, Asaf starting. What are the problems that you see uh, if a protocol, a DeFi protocol, reacts uh, and it is actually a false positive? Uh, uh, IR false positive and react fast, I don't think that it's a good solution because uh, damaging the user experience that much, it's not something that brings uh, a lot of, uh, of adoption to the market and uh, a lot of protocols and confidence uh, to this ecosystem. Uh, we have the ability to uh, minimize the false positive to a very low uh, number. And uh, I think that some of us uh, uh, reached that uh, small, very small number. And uh, this is something that we can accomplish, then we don't need to, to just uh, let it uh, be a number. Okay. Yeah, maybe the Alex, can, that you were already talking. So, like, what do you think about fo false positives? Like, do you think they can be a big barrier even for the adoption uh, of Web3 monitoring tools? Because, you know, from the perspective of the protocol, like, even my personal experience is that, yeah, if, everything is really good and it seems that it will prevent, but if we, if a, a big protocol like takes like the decision of freezing, like uh, let's say a pool, uh, this could be quite damaging if uh, like the alert was uh, not correct. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. It can be quite, quite damaging, sure. And uh, this is why we should deal with this problem of, of increasing the, you know, the both uh, the precision and recall. Um, However, I think that uh, false positives are inevitable if you want to act early. So we still need to deal with the, the risk of false positive alert. And uh, I think that, uh, so yeah, it's inevitable. Yeah. And uh, now we, uh, uh, all we have to do is to, uh, is to design the protection system for which uh, some degree of false positive rates would be not critical. Uh, for example, uh, if we if we discuss the architecture that you personally uh, uh, it, uh, that you personally uh, created for the uh, monitoring detection of Avia, I think that it's pretty reasonable because it's uh, it's it's, a it's decentralized in a way and it. Uh, involves several types of reactions, not just, you know, just pulling the trigger and posing the whole protocol, you know, and nothing can happen and all the, all the integrations are damaged in immediately, etc., etc. No, um, we can just uh, perform some minor actions, for example, limiting the funds withdrawals or limiting transfer inside, inside protocols. And uh, these could, normal users, won't even notice such uh, such minor actions, but they still will be very um, how to say. So they still will be able to prevent the hack from happening. So I won't take more time. I think I, I can go from yeah, no. forever. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, and and related with a similar topic is uh, it, it feels that there is like some big difference uh, in, in in structures like of. DAOs uh, and like even the teams themselves 
and their approach to security on Web3 versus uh, well, traditional software and security related with traditional software. So do, do you really think uh, that there is something really fundamentally different or is it just a matter of uh, that we are too early like, and this will just improve over time? Maybe, Mayor, you can comment. Uh, yeah, so it also connects to your previous question about false positive, right? In the end, organization need to build an incident response plan, right? So if you want to protect yourself from specific attack vectors, maybe in this attack vector there is less false positive and then you can be much more reactive. Versus, for example, private key leakage that you uh, we, we will face more false positives and then you need to uh, bring a different uh, response. So you need to come with a response plan. And this uh, real-time monitoring and response, incident response plan are well established in the traditional finance, right? You can see them in every organization. And basically, this enables the organizations to come with a structured way to deal with incident response. Because during an attack, there is a chaos. You need to define who will be, what the communication, the responsibilities, uh, the decision makers. So all of these plans should be defined before the incident response plan, right? And together with the real-time monitoring uh, solutions, uh, it can bring a lot of benefits to the DeFi space. So we don't see such plans and such monitoring solutions mature yet in the DeFi space, but I think that's a matter of evolution, right? It will take some time, but we will be there. Yeah, maybe Domantas, do you, you have anything? Uh, yeah, so I, I have a few points about this. First of all, like we talked with one of the projects that mentioned that they would be better stop their protocols like three, four times per month than lose a dollar. So like it seems that some projects are kind of okay with, you know, false positives and reacting on those. Uh, but se second, uh, I think we are still quite early in our like monitoring solutions. So they should be treaded like carefully. And like you, I think like you can rely on them and they are pretty reliable, but uh, as, as a, my colleague mentioned, like you really need to have a good incident response, you know, and, and have a good plan. Okay, I got this trigger. This is for smart contract A. What do we do next? How do we triage this? Who is the person responsible for triaging? This came maybe in the middle of the night. Who is responsible at the night? So the problem is that a lot of current projects don't have that set up yet. And, and yeah, that's a, that's a huge problem. So, yeah. Yeah, following a bit on that, like, because it's, uh, I mean, it feels quite natural, no? That the, like Web3 should learn from, from traditional uh, security. So, uh, which is the role that you think that the tools themselves, because how it works usually in Web3 is that somebody puts example, uh, or, and even not on the product side, but more on the tooling side, puts example of how they should be used. Uh, and, and, and well, then there is some adoption. So, for example, uh, Yaniv, like, what do you think, which is the role of, like, basically the teams building the tools on educating, like, uh, the Web3 developers, like, and, and trying to build frameworks, uh, procedures, et cetera? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and I must say that we want to, and we are starting to building that, and I'm, like, inviting everyone here in the panel and in the group to... Uh, to collaborate on that, to build this open framework for best practices of how a protocol should be protected. And I think that companies should work on that together with the ecosystem. So we'll have similar thing to what we are seeing uh, in traditional world, where you have security in depth, in layers. It is starting from, uh, you know, security by design, because if you design your protocol the right way, um, you can prevent many hacks. It continues to, um, to auditing, to formal verification, to AppSec, to monitoring, to security orchestration, to instance response, red teaming, which is let's play and let someone hack us um, and see how we react on that. Because when there is a hack and we've been in like dozens of war rooms, it's, a, it's chaotic. It's chaotic. Like everyone is asking who is connected to Binance, who is connected to Circle, uh, who can uh, help us trace the funds, right? And it's, of course, it makes sense today because uh, the ecosystem is still not mature, um, but there are so many things that we can learn from traditional finance 
where you have like procedures in place, you have playbooks in place. Um, and I totally agree with what Domantas and Mayer just mentioned. Um, like this question is just a segue to just what, what they answered, right? Um, and I think with that, like companies like everyone here in the panel um, should offer the ecosystem like this frameworks, um, again, in, in an open and joint initiative. But also, I think protocols, and this comes like to you, uh, Ernesto, and like we're seeing that with other forest, um, protocols should also like raise this awareness. Because I think that when you have these blue chips protocols that will start to raise the awareness, um, everybody else will follow. So it's kind of a, like a joint work, both from the security companies and the blue chip protocols. Maybe your, your thoughts, Gal, on, on, on the topic of procedures and so? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think uh, when I look at the traditional security, like where, where is the focus? So there is a very big assumption uh, that you will get hacked. Like um, a lot of the budgets and a lot of the tools that are used today in traditional security are around finding, finding hacks, finding malicious activity in your web application or in your network, and then limiting uh, the blast radius or limiting the exposure of the tech. Uh, and I think, uh, and I, by the way, talk about this uh, later today, but I think that we, we haven't come with that mindset uh, in, in crypto. And, and when we look at layer twos and more infrastructure, optimized infrastructure that is being built, more code uh, will be more complex, like there will be more complex application. And I, I think hex and exploit will not stop. They will just increase. So. I, I think we need to get to this mindset of really thinking, uh, I think as Yaniv said as well, fit, uh, doing the right processes, building the right design inside the smart contract that address this, like how do I limit uh, something bad from happening when it does happen? How do I have the right processes in place, uh, even in a decentralized uh, manner to stop uh, this from uh, hurting? Um, and I think there are there are solutions. Like we are building these solutions, and we it's a lot of uh, education because a lot of the teams that are building applications today don't have a security uh, function in the team. Um, so there is a lack of talent in in the area, in, and um, I think a lot of what I think everyone here is trying to do is also to wear this. Uh, uh, to increase this awareness and, and to be this function to all of these uh, applications. Yeah, and, and following, following a bit on, on the topic, maybe Carlos, you can comment on that, like, but uh, is, is there, a, because when, when you explain, like, and what we are just talking, it, it seems pretty obvious, right? Like, that if you can protect the protocol like, and if the tools kind of work, like, uh, even being an early stage or not, it, it, they are just net positive. Uh, why not? Why the movement is still starting, or almost starting nowadays, and not one year ago or two years ago? Uh, and is there any fundamental difference between like the the Web two and Web three teams? Like, is just what Gal just mentioned that is lack of awareness, lack of, of security procedures, or what do you think is? I would definitely lack of awareness is there, but it's also difficult because it's so flexible when you're working in the web3 space like if you are working in in, in web2 it's much more limited the things that you can do whereas you can have like almost whatever going on in a contract and that's already like a starting point and then on top of that everything happens so fast all the time with a lot of limitations like for example if you try to use machine learning models and you are trying to run real time it's since you want to be decentralized and you don't want to have everything together, you are going to face at some point problems of, okay, where do I have my history of data? Like you cannot keep collecting things in each one of, of your decentralized nodes because you're going to explode them. So how do you want, how, how can you do machine learning where you need like six months of historic of an address if you cannot keep that, um, that information in memory and there is no real way where you can keep querying all the addresses that are doing any type of, um, anything in the, in the network right so there is like 
on top of it being very new and um, it's something that it's actually difficult to do like it's just wide and then a, a part of a part of it is also being learning on how to do things and like putting things in the right direction and like starting creating frameworks and everything that we have been commenting but that also is going to take time and it's it's moving it's definitely moving in the in the last couple of years and it's going to keep moving and it's going to keep getting better and we are going to be learning how to do the things and we are going to be improving all the um, all the systems and being more safe but it's not something that we are going to learn overnight because it's actually a difficult problem what do you think andy like on the on the top uh, <clears throat> Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I, I think uh, there are a couple of properties in the uh, Web3 compared to Web2 that uh, makes the Web3 more vulnerable and more attackable. So I think I, I can think of a couple of things. One of that is openness. In the Web3, it's everything's open. This my contract is open. The source code is open, right? So everyone can look at your um, source code to locate the vulnerabilities. But in Web2, uh, even uh, you want to look at the vulnerability inside of some, some bank system, you cannot do that because you do not have the source code, right? Even you can reverse engineer to do that, but it's, 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 it's a risk, highly risk part. So I think openness makes the Web3 more vulnerable than, uh, sorry, not, not more vulnerable, it makes the uh, Web3 more open, but uh, more open to everyone, or even to the attackers, so this is one of the point. And the second is that, um, some mechanism inside the blockchain makes the attacker much easier, like the flash known things, right? So in traditional uh, finance system, we do not have flash known. Like if you want to attack a protocol, you need to have one million US dollars, then this may uh, make most of the attackers, they, they cannot do that because they do not have one million dollars. But on um, blockchain, you, you can have that, right? You can use a flash known to borrow like 10 million um, dollars to launch an attack. So this also make the things worse. And the third thing is that we do not have enough tools inside Web3 um, to locate the vulnerabilities because um, I'm a professor in, um, in universities and uh, um, I, I can see many students they are working on a traditional Web2 security area. They can um, develop tools to locate some sophisticated uh, vulnerability inside some uh, traditional software. But for Web3 um, uh, smart contracts, um, there are next uh, uh, very useful tools we can locate some um, vulnerabilities that have the uh, business logical oriented because the business logical oriented is a logical bug. If you want to um, um, detect a logical bug, uh, like if we want to develop a funding system to the uh, logical bug, we need to deal a lot of challenges. We need to um, how to mutate the inputs, how to uh, how to detect dependency between the different intact, uh, inputs and how to, um, pro, pro, uh, how to provide a very good oracle. These are challenges we have not solved in the Web3, so we lack of tools. So all these things make the uh, Web3 a very um, um, good place for attackers, but uh, unfortunately um, a very bad place for protocols. Yeah, I think that's my points. Some idea that, that, that was commented before is that, uh, well, it's possible to, to detect, that is clear, like it's, it's possible to prevent, uh, at least at, up to a certain point. Uh, but then about the, the levers, like that needs to be exercised, like on, on, on the particular protocols, that it could be an option that uh, partially like stop the deposits of certain amounts, like, and, and be focused on a subset of users versus the others. Uh, for me, that uh, leads to, to think like that monitoring is not something that it should be just thought once the protocol is deployed, but something that w should be taken in, into account like while you are uh, actively developing like the, the system. So maybe, for example, Alex, like uh, when do you think is like a, a good moment to start like already thinking on, OK, I want to apply this kind of tool and it will be important to have this mechanism of my protocol in order to protect. It's a great question. I would say that uh, as for now, we are so early and we have so little actual battle experience with the threat prevention, with the active, I mean, active threat prevention when we, actually, when we really prevented some hack from happening and we didn't see uh, a lot of unsuccessful hack preventions and they will also take place somewhere in the future. So uh, the best practices are still to be developed somewhere, maybe a year from now, 
maybe fur further, uh, further. So I think that as for now, we are in the place uh, when we should just experiment with things. I think that uh, at some point uh, we will have uh, something like uh, Open Zeppelin library for threat prevention, and you could just just uh, uh, integrate it into your project and and just just be sure that it works. That uh, okay, I can set up any kind of monitoring now, and it will just work. But for now, I think it sh we should set up you know a big uh, discussion with the protocols, with customers alike, with the liquidity providers. Uh, in order to find a solution that could uh, fit everyone in the place, not only, I mean, not only DeFi protocol owners, I, I mean, DAO part participants, because liquidity providers are also very important players and the retails, cus retail customers are also imp important uh, people in this, in this ecosystem. So I think with all, with, with all being said, I don't know. <laughs> Probably that is like the most responsible answer, like the, I don't know. But yeah, something that you mentioned, uh, like you mentioned the different participants, right? Like on, like, it's not only about the, the, the protocols developing, I mean, the, the teams developing the protocol, but liquidity providers uh, and so on. And of course, like then there is like multiple different systems. Like, so one question that maybe on this, like I want the opinion of multiple one of you, is that uh, if you can put an example, like more than an example, like uh, which is the system at the moment or systems, uh, one each, that you think makes these monitoring techniques to shine? So let, let's say DeFi versus breaches versus like security of funds, like on on wallets, like, uh, yeah. If you can maybe Gal. Yeah, I, I, I think that, um, and I'm referring a bit to the topic that we talked about uh, previously. I think that we need to, at least, at least my personal thinking is that we need to to change the like change the mindset, right? Like we talked about all the challenges that right, that Web three and decentralized system brings uh, to security, but the way that I see it is actually it's an opportunity because. Quite frankly, um, and I've I've built systems uh, before in Web3. Building a hypernative on Web2 would have taken us years to get the data and the vo and the vulnerabilities and to look like the fact that you can see all the code, the fact that you can see all the interactions with the code across all the chains, uh, and see it historically. I think is a huge, uh, of course, it's a huge advantage for attackers, but it's also a huge advantage for uh, the protectors and the people that are building the security. So I think that, that if we we'll look at the characteristics of Web3 system and uh, actually leverage them, uh, we can build solutions uh, together that, that will be even better than, than solutions that are built on Web2. So, to me, it's like DeFi. Of course, DeFi is is a target for attacks uh, because, right? Like the the gain is very clear for for a hacker. In the end, hackers have um, like a very you know they go where the money is and where uh, they can get the most uh, gain in the in the simplest manner, right? Like hackers don't like to work hard if possible, uh, and this is what I think what we are trying to do here, right? Like make their life harder. Yeah, maybe Mayor, your opinion, like system that is particularly good for. <coughs> yeah, as uh, as Gal said, so I think it's uh, eventually an evolution, right? We will uh, learn from every incident and every attack, and we'll build a better system and a better monitoring and uh, response uh, systems. But eventually, I, I, I believe that uh, AI can bring here the advantage. Uh, because in the end, also it will be a cat and mouse game, right? The attackers will be more sophisticated and they're the protectors and so on and so on. And then we'll need to come with uh, novel ways to detect. And in the end, you know, a DeFi protocols, I would say, it has a huge surface attack, right? It's not only an on-chain, it has also UI, right? It also has a wallet, it has uh, a contract, so you need to protect it as a system. Uh, so eventually, I believe that we will come with a holistic system that will be able to protect uh, different protocols. Maybe Domantas, your take? 
Um, yeah, so I think we should use uh, 2080 uh, per simple principle here because basically the biggest TVL is in DeFi protocols and of course naturally the hackers are targeting those. So of course we should also focus our monitoring uh, on that. But then uh, going deeper, I think what's particularly interesting to monitor is the, the forks because previously we, we noticed that like a lot of hacks that happened were on projects that decided to fork a well-established protocol, but then did some changes maybe in the tokenomics or like some other adjustments. And in the end, developers maybe didn't know what exactly they're doing. They maybe added or removed some code and that led to some like bad math, bad calculations. And, and basically with those protocols, you have pretty clear understanding what they are supposed to do and they, how they are supposed to work. But then if you know that this protocol is a fork of another, you kind of can apply the same monitoring rules to all of them and then see what's the, the delta there, how they are like different. And, and then if the delta is big enough, you can kind of understand that maybe there's something wrong with that protocol. So I think, yeah, that's, that's where I would put my eggs, basically. Okay, yeah, maybe you... Yeah, so as for the protocols out there right now, I think the most obvious one that can use the monitoring are, of course, the bridges. Uh, they are all, most of the logic is off chain and uh, it's uh, logical that they use it first. Of course, the DeFi protocols has most of the money in it, so uh, uh, it's obviously. Uh, the best uh, approach to go to these customers uh, first, but uh, we will see it first of all at Bridges. Then we will see a standard for security at DeFi protocols uh, in 2016. Audit wasn't, uh, wasn't the standard for security yet. 2017, it became a standard for protocols. Now monitoring becoming a standard for protocols, and we will see, I believe, a prevention that's going to be a standard also for the protocol. Some of it will be on-chain, some of it will be maybe in the other layers of the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah maybe fo following on, on another item that was mentioned, that uh, well, everything is quite open uh, on, on DeFi, uh, but that includes uh, also like even the teams that are contributing to a protocol. So one potential problem that can be can be ambition is that the malicious attackers like will understand so deeply like the technology of monitoring that they will try to like uh, well avoid it and still do the attack so how do you think that the, this uh, because in, in traditional uh, software and security the systems are of course way more close you can have privilege hard privilege that are enforced but when let, let's say an example like of a DAO on where you have like three different teams uh, and you need to provide them or provide to the DAO like certain monitoring tool. Like, so how to do it in a way that the attackers don't know uh, how are the, the techniques? So maybe, uh, Yaniv, you can. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think first having like the fact that we are decentralized is very challenging. It's like among other things, like I think it's like it's top three um, challenges in the space. But I will answer it like and also combine an answer to the to the previous questions. I think the way to deal with that and to deal with like system that will shine from like using monitoring solutions is basically combining security by design, procedures, and tools. It's like when you want to build the fortress. You won't build it like in the bottom of a valley, but rather on top of the mountain, right? And then things become much easier. So even if you're building um, like a protocol and you know that everything starts centralized and then along the years it becomes decentralized, you need to think ahead of time of, okay, let's build it and do security by design for the moment when we will be fully decentralized. And now everybody, everybody, everybody else are aware that hacks will happen. And like Dal mentioned it before, uh, there is a challenge that people in the space don't think that can, they can be hacked. When you will have this notion, where will you understand that DAOs are the next phase in each and every protocol, 
then you will build like the right procedures, then you will build maybe like time locks, maybe you will, um, you will organize the DAO in a specific way that will be able to, to react uh, and act upon uh, incidents. Um, time, will, like, time will tell, I think we are still not there yet, um, but with the evolution that we see with the monitoring and the awareness in the system, in the ecosystem, I hope that next year we'll have like uh, like more like we'll have white papers that will talk about it, um, and this notion of combining security by design with how DAO should react, and the the providers will just consolidate and will have the right security procedures. Yeah, maybe your take, Carlos, on. on completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, like, the same as the teams, like, know, like, that, the, that there is monitoring tools and work certain way, how you avoid the attackers to be aware of how the monitoring tool to then, like, circumvent the monitoring tool by new methodology. Honestly, at some point, like, as it keeps evolving and getting better, if you're good enough, does it really matter that they actually know that they are going to be detected? Like, at, at the end, the point, what you want to do is to put there a deferent for them to actually not do things. If it's just so much more difficult because they know that no matter what they are trying to do, they have exactly the code that is going to be run and they are running it locally, they are doing simulations, and you're always finding it, and they are spending time and time again until they actually can do something that might not trigger everything, then that's, a, that's also still successful, right? Like, because you're just making it so much more difficult and putting it, in the end you're giving security by, okay, I'm going to find you almost whatever you do and let you find something super niche. And then once that happens, we are going to be on top of that and building on top of that. And it's ugly because that shouldn't happen, but it's a way of learning. Like it's a little bit of, um, of a cat and mouse game. Like, okay, uh, we get better, they get better, we get better, they get better and so on. But that's the thing, at some point I feel that as we grow and we learn more and we build better defense mechanisms, even if they, even if they know the mechanisms and they can reproduce it, it's still going to find a lot of the things that they are doing. It's like when you have a lock on a bicycle, like if you really try to break a lock, you break it, right? But it's, it's therefore deferring you and making it very difficult and wasting more time and giving more traces so that you can be found. It's a little bit of the same. Yeah, I think following on that is actually quite interesting, but uh, the same as like maybe looking for perfection is not the, not the approach because like um, it will work without the perfection. Like uh, how, how you see like in terms of speed and, and the practical speed nowadays. So because from my way of thinking, I think like a lot of people like in the Web3 development uh, side is that we are used like to kind of perfect solutions like, and we, we think that, okay, monitoring, sh there should not be any case, like, on where it can be skipped. Like, so maybe your, your take, Alex, on, like, in practice, like, on the last month's year, like, is that perfection from the part of the attackers there, or is more like there could be always ways, like, of, uh, or almost always ways of? Uh, I would say that in Web3, we are not really accustomed to security, for security to be perfect. So security is always imperfect <laughs> in the tree, at least. Um, I would say yes, that uh, we we will still be imperfect, uh, but I think that uh, uh, for the same uh, for that uh, the same reason, uh, you know, just. Uh, let me rephrase. So, uh, as far as I remember, in the middle of the 20th century, uh, bank robberies uh, in England suddenly stopped. It just because the risk was too high to take it. So, we can just, uh, just increase uh, the risk for the hacker, you know, increase the d difficulty, the complexity of the task, etc., etc., etc. So, at, at some point, it will be just pointless. It will be easier to just uh, f I, I don't know, farm some shit coins uh, to g get some easy money than to drain liquidity pool. And um, I also had another point on this. What Could you please repeat the question, sorry. 
No, I, I was more focused like on the on the practical speed. Like so, uh, w when you look at like a potential solution, it will be okay. Like I want to protect an MEV case that it will get executed atomically, like and it will drain the whole protocol. So I was more asking of from what you see like last month, last year, like we. Uh, is that the case at the moment? Are so sophisticated the actors, or is it just uh, more of overthinking from part of the engineers that try to? Protect? I think I think uh, that uh, when we really start stopping the actual attacks, they will need to do to do something about this. And I think that uh, within a year we will see more sophisticated sophisticated hackers, and they will try to obfuscate the attack. They will try to hide the attack completely uh, with the pri going to private pools and uh, for any of these ways of uh, you know hiding attack or obfuscating it or bypassing monitoring uh, in any other way uh, there are solutions and uh, i'm afraid that i will go over time if I'll, if i you know describe all of them but uh, solutions exist and uh, but they will but I, I think that we will start thinking about them in practical way only maybe the next year because earlier it's to, to me it just doesn't make sense because hackers are not that complicated they are so lazy they uh, deploy attacking smart contract and then and then broadcast actual attack transaction you know maybe sometimes uh, within several hours and uh, so it's it's insanely slow. They must not do this, but they do this because they are lazy. So I think that we must teach them to be less lazy. <laughs> yeah, and, and a bit related with that, like uh, maybe for maybe for you, Andy. Like, how how do you see the implementation of new privacy solutions, like on on blockchain smart contract? How do you you see the relation with? this monitoring because like on one side it will benefit the attackers even more like on the other side it could actually be a place maybe to plug monitoring in some optional way so oh yeah uh, this is a really very good question because we have a, a lot of debates inside in inside the block so um I, I, for the privacy um um, um, transaction so it's like the flash bot right so we can see many attackers are abusing these services to launch an attack so um, one of my, my one of my colleagues, uh, um, uh, he proposed a solution that we should, you know, um, vest some transaction inside the flashbot to uh, prevent the flashbot from being abused. But I do not think this solution, this solution works in practice, but I do not think this solution can be accessible by the community because you are vesting, you are, you are vetting the transactions on a decentralized world, right? This cannot be accepted by the community. Um, so I think, but but still, um, how to uh, how to from uh, but still from the um, um, privacy service pers uh, provider's perspective, how to prevent their service from from abused by the attackers? Still, an open question. I think at least we can do a a, a, a couple of things. First, we can um, if if uh, if the IS attacker has been confirmed, at least we can you know uh, work with authority you know to solve some um, uh, to to share some information with authority to trick the attackers uh, by uh, such uh, service providers. I think that what, what, what uh, one thing what we can do. I think another thing is that uh, maybe uh, in the future we can add some community-based uh, venting systems inside the transactions. It's not just a central, it's a community-based, we can vest some transactions. If, if it's a malicious, then we can, uh, like, we can delay sending the transaction. We do not block this, we can delay sending the transaction. They can, um, I think they can, um, uh, they cannot solve the issue, but they can mitigate uh, the issues currently we have. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah, maybe like a uh, last one that also was mentioned uh, during all your takes, like uh, is uh, was the concept of like the forks, like so that there is like uh, a lot of people, like a lot of developers that just fork other protocols, like and there is quite repeated pattern of detecting hacks into forks, like so. What two actually questions together? One is that wh why you think is so? Is just like the the team that doesn't put too much effort, uh, and the other will be how the like big protocols that maybe don't give so much importance to that, the, how they can incorporate that in the, the procedure. So basically looking 
like uh, all the hacks happening in forks and to, as a way of understanding of, of your own protocol. Maybe Mayor can comment on that. Yeah, so I think that this might be addressed uh, during the development, right? And maybe tools like Sertora or other tools can address this problem and to see what kind of libraries are you using, maybe this uh, libraries in blacklist uh, and so on and so on. So I think that this problem might, can be easily addressed, you know, it does, just needs attention, education, and to be more, uh, 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 more precise when you're developing. But I don't think that this is a, a huge problem that we can all solve today. Okay. Yeah, so we are kind of almost at the end. Uh, so well, thanks everybody. Uh, maybe we can leave like some, we have four minutes. So maybe if there is any question from the audience for anybody here, me included. Hi, um, I'm I'm just like hear that Andy talked about some traditional Web two uh, software that your students and probably like PhD student or undergrad were using for detecting like traditional traditional security flaws. So, is there any recommendations that we can take a look at? Oh yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah um, so it's me, right? You're asking me, right? You're asking me, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, I think for, for some uh, recommendations, I think I'm uh, uh, looking at the, 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 the DeFi hack um, maps is a very good start, you know, to from uh, tra uh, transforming from the Web2 security to Web3 security because it has some, so many, uh, uh, so many past uh, hack transaction you can analyze to understand the, why the hack happens, what's the vulnerability there, uh, how to trigger attacks. And uh, after, after um, getting all these insights, then you can have more um, uh, understanding of the Web3 hacks, and then you can write some tools, uh, you know, to analyze the attacks, to uh, detect the attacks. You can have the static dynamic analysis tools. Um, you can you can develop by yourself. You can improve all the existing tools, and uh, you can have more knowledge on this uh, area. Hey, thank you everyone for the panel. Interesting. So I have a couple of questions, but I, I will just start with one is, Given that we have today on the panel, I know, eight, nine companies to be monitoring, I was wondering, how are you guys collaborating on sharing data? Uh, it feels like um, you could all benefit from sharing threat data, monitoring data, putting together a standard for alerts in a machine readable way. Um, my question is where you are starting to doing that? And if you're not, uh, why? Um, all of the all of the startups over here, uh, I believe it's their it's the starting point. Uh, uh, finding the the market and how to reach the market the better way. But uh, you're absolutely right, and uh, we already discussed it uh, before. A uh, few of us uh, to collaborate and. Uh, and sharing the data because it's bringing more security for the ecosystem. And security for the ecosystem is the first thing that we should uh, take care of. And uh, yes, we are starting to move this also as a share uh, vision. Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, could you explain the process of front running the malicious transaction? For example, like uh, what would be the infrastructure setup? Somebody wants to tackle? Maybe somebody different? Yeah, maybe I can talk something about it because we have some e some experience of, you know, front running attack transactions. So basically you need to have an infrastructure to listen into the memory port transactions and then you need to have an um, um, automatic way to synthesize your, uh, your, your front running transaction. Like you need to copy all the attack uh, um, behaviors in, uh, from the attack contract inside your own smart contract, then you need to replace all the some critical variables, like you need to replace all the attack address to your own uh, black hat uh, addresses, then you need to have some infrastructure to quickly uh, send your transaction on the blockchain. So that's basically uh, how, that, how the system basically works. 
Sorry, uh, do you still run your own node or do you collaborate with other Flashball builder? Uh, I cannot say publicly here, but I, I think have a, your own node is a very good a, a very good start. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Thanks everybody. We were a lot of people here, but I think it was like a good result. So uh, hopefully, yeah, it was interesting for the for everybody there. Thanks. <laughs>